Westfield Memorial Hospital provides high-quality health care to residents of Western New York offering patients the most sophisticated medical advancements while keeping the ease and familiarity of a community hospital. Support for Chautauqua Sunrise has been provided by WRFA 107.9 FM, Jamestown's public radio station, streaming online 24-7 at WRFALP.com. Low power to the people. Chautauqua Sunrise is made possible by a grant from Fredonia Place, a continuing care retirement community providing dignity in a modern luxury environment. Meter's Restaurant, a family tradition for over 50 years in downtown Ripley, is a proud supporter of Chautauqua Sunrise. Meter's provides all-day dining, banquet services, and custom catering, specializing in pie. Funding for Chautauqua Sunrise is provided in part by the Chautauqua County Industrial Development Agency with offices in Jamestown and Dunkirk helping businesses to prosper throughout Chautauqua County. From supporting people with disabilities to enjoy great lives to providing health care services that are available to anyone, the Resource Center has been improving our county for more than 60 years. Learn more about how the Resource Center makes a positive difference in people's lives. From the Access Chautauqua Studios in Mayville, it's Chautauqua Sunrise. Chautauqua Sunrise is hosted by Doc Hamels and supported by the award-winning volunteers at Access Chautauqua. We are here to share local news, colorful interviews, and events of interest to everyone. Chautauqua Sunrise is broadcast live Saturday mornings each week from 9 to 10 a.m. Send events via email or call us live. Check us out on YouTube and Facebook. And now, from the Access Chautauqua Studios, it's Chautauqua Sunrise. Hey everybody, good morning. I'm Doc Hamels and welcome to Chautauqua Sunrise. We have a really cool show in store for you, as we always do. Uh, but this one is from a historical point of view and I just can't get enough of this kind of stuff of talking about Chautauqua history and local history and all the folks that came before us and all these little tidbits that I think you're going to find pretty fascinating. Well, good afternoon wherever you are in the world, over in Europe, good morning for anyone that's uh, in, in, in behind us across the United States or good morning all you that are here local watching the show. So glad you could join us. Also, good afternoon. To all my listeners on WRFA 107.9, low power of the people in Jamestown, Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Thanks for coming in and having a listen. I think you're going to find the show really cool. Um, hope you're all doing well. The weather has uh, kind of leveled off finally. <laughs> Uh, 60 degrees this morning when I came into the studio. Justin, how about your place? About the same thing in the 60s? Oh, yeah. You know, but I keep looking outside and I keep thinking, oh, it's going to come down, it's going to rain. It's like a 2% chance of rain. I don't know, just, we've got this cloud cover that's just sort of holding in the moisture right now. It's kind of muggy out there. But it's spring, and uh, you know, my wife and I, we talk about what's our favorite season. I, I, I guess spring. I guess I, I have to go with spring. Uh, right now, all the flowering bushes are out, and the uh, apple trees, the peaches, the cherries, uh, all the flowers in, in the garden are starting to do their thing. Uh, it's just irises popped up the other day and uh, daffodils are done, but uh, just really good stuff. And probably the other part of spring that I love the most is watching the different birds come in. Where I live, I think I've booked at least 26 varieties of birds over, uh, over the years that come to the feeder or by the water garden or wherever. And I noticed that the uh, gross beaks, the rose bro uh, breasted gross beaks, they're one of my favorites. Uh, they just showed up the other day in the goldfinches. And then me and Brody, you know, Brody's my little dog that you see at the beginning of the show there. Uh, we spotted a yellow warbler last night. And uh, they got these really, really um, unique sounds when they, they chirp and do their little sound there. 
And uh, so we've kind of tuned our ears in for the various, various uh, types of birds. So uh, if you haven't done this, just go out in the morning for a walk or especially in the evening, before, just before the sun sets, the birds are up moving around and doing their thing and you can spot some real beautiful varieties. Still waiting for the scarlet tanagers coming in and maybe the indigo buntings and gosh, all the other little birds that come in uh, from, that sometimes they just come in for a little bit and then they're on their way somewhere else. But uh, we have so much here in Chautauqua County, especially in the rural parts. Uh, but I would suspect most homes, if you put out bird seed or whatever, you'll, you'll see quite a few varieties of birds. Yeah, I know, there's bears out there too. So uh, you gotta make sure your feeders are where the bears can't get to. But uh, so far, so good this year. The bear hasn't uh, tormented me. Last year, it popped open part of my railing to get to the feed. So uh, I, I got it up pretty high this year. But anyways, spring is here and it's just wonderful. This coming uh, weekend, tomorrow, is Mother's Day. So special uh, uh, congratulations, I guess. Uh, have a great day for all the moms out there. And you know, and I always say, you know, a mom comes in different forms. There's stepmoms, there's moms, there's foster moms, there's aunts that sometimes uh, perform that duty. Uh, neighbors, grandmas, great grandmas, uh, sisters, uh, everybody. <laughs> That, teachers. what? Teachers. Teachers, yeah, well, they're kind of a form of a mom, you know. Um, special day tomorrow, and I, and I hope you enjoy your day. It looks like the weather should be nice. I know we're all going out for dinner later on, and um, so it should be a good day. And then one of my underwriters, Meters Restaurants, I can do this every once in a while, just to let you know, they're having a special uh, buffet breakfast and a buffet uh, dinner uh, for Mother's Day, so you can check them out. And uh, glad to share that with you. All right, uh, let's see, I think that's all I have in his way of introductory notes. So let's get right to our announcements and then my guest who's waiting patiently to come on. Okay, ready Jeff, here we go. Infinity Summer Registration. You know I'm really high on Infinity and uh, uh, this is really something you might check out. You know, sometimes the kids, they're done with school and there's sort of that big empty space between June and, and September. Well, look at this one. If you're interested in music, art, dance, or theater, then Infinity Center is the place for you. Join us for summer lessons and classes for one of their exciting summer camp events. Students 18, oh, 5 to 18 can sign up online before June 22 to begin lessons on an instrument or within another uh, art form of your choice. You know, a lot of kids, uh, they want to try an instrument, but they're a little shy. This is a great way to check it out. For our students ages 8 to 12, Infinity is offering two summer day camps, time travelers camp, and cultural world tour camp. Hmm. Both camps will explore a variety of music and arts activities. If you're interested, go to their website, Infinity Performing Arts, all one word, dot org, to register. Infinity Performing Arts, all one word, dot org. Or you give them a call at 664-0991. I wish my kids lived closer to that when they were younger and they would have been all over that. That would have been a lot of fun. All right. <clears throat> Right along with the same group, Pearl City Clay House. Quick Clay Classes. Say that 10 times fast, Quick Clay Classes. Pearl City Clay House is offering a series of quick clay events. These very short workshops are perfect for those who just want to dip a toe into the world of ceramics. Every time I think of this, I think of that show, that movie Ghost, where the he's, he's sitting at, spinning the wheel and he's forming a a pot or something, and the music's playing in the background. <laughs> no experience needed, beginners welcome. Gather up your friends and come out to play. All events in the Quick Clay series are only $10. Upcoming Quick Clay events include herb, stripping bowls, no, striping, it's gotta be striping, not stripping. Herb striping bowls on May 19th, miniature vases or vases on May 26, pinch pot cups on May 27th, tabletop tip tip. <laughs> you guys are killing me today. Table tic tac 
toe boards on June 3rd and small bird feeders on June 13th. Wow, I didn't realize you could make all those things with pottery. To visit uh, them, you can go to Pearl City Clay House, right? That's all one word, pearlcityclayhouse.org, uh, to register and find out a whole lot more, okay? So let's keep on going. All right, this is the uh, next one coming up, and this is right in my hometown. All right, uh, this is called the Owen Miller 5K Buddy Run Walk. It's going to be held next Saturday, May 20th, start time at 9 a.m. Participants should meet at the bell in front of the Ripley Central School. The race walk will be taking place on Wiley Road, all ages. Um, it's free. Donations, of course, are welcome and appreciated. What is a buddy run? This is kind of, kind of a new concept. This is a memorial walk run for a student who was part of the class of 2023, Owen Miller. For this race, you can run or walk with a buddy. If you do, you have to cross the finish line with your buddy to demonstrate that you are never alone through anything, even a 5K. All donations go to the Chautauqua Lake Owen Miller Scholarship, which was created with the purpose of promoting kindness in memory of Owen. Okay? And, you know, the whole story behind that basically is, you know, when you get someone that is on their own and they get isolated, they kind of, they don't feel like they're connected. And I think this is a nice way of connecting with people and, and, and remembering that we need to reach out to each other and keep track of those that feel a little bit isolated. Okay? So that's coming up next month, uh, uh, Saturday, May 20th, 9 a.m. in front of the Ripley Central School by the Bell. Okay. Let's go to the movies. Big Fish and Air to show at the Regiland A Center for the Arts. Big Fish uh, is going to be held May 17th at 7 p.m. It is a special engagement showing that is part of the 100th anniversary of the opening of the Palace Theater. 100 years old. Throughout his life, Edward Bloom, played by uh, uh, Ewan, e how do you say that? E-W-A-N, Ewan, Ewan? McGregor has always been a man of big appetites, enormous passions, and tall tales. In his uh, later years, portrayed by five-time Best Actor Oscar nominee Albert Finney, he remains a huge mystery to his son, William, played by Billy Cr Crudup. These names are kind of tough. Uh, now, to get to, uh, now, to get to know the real man, uh, Will begins piecing together a true picture of his father from flashbacks of his amazing adventures in this marvel of a movie called Big Fish. It's PG-13. It's 125 minutes long. I think I've seen that. I think it's got some really cool little storylines in there. Then, from award-winning director Ben Affleck, Air, that's the name of the movie, is going to be shown May 20th at 8 p.m. It reveals the game-changing partnership between a uh, then undiscovered Michael Jordan, hmm, rings a bell, and Nike's fledgling basketball division, which revolutionized the world of sports and culture with the Air Jordan brand. Air is rated R and it's 112 minutes long. Most movies are $7 plus a dollar for the restoration. Uh, Got to keep the place up. Tickets can be purchased from 12 to 5 p.m. Mondays and Fridays, 12 to 8 p.m. Uh, Wednesdays at the box office, or give them a call at 484-7070. All right, a few more. <clears throat> let's go to Alive Downtowns. All right, let's see what we got here. Alive Downtowns is a coalition of 13 downtown historic performance art centers across upstate New York. It's uh, and Jamestown is, is excited to hear of the New York State government's decision to invest $5 million in their local arts organization. This facility, wait a minute, these facilities serve over 5 million people annually and are cornerstones to the upkeep and improvement of their respective downtowns. Their combined annual economic uh, impact is $900 million. It's amazing and heartening to have focused support from our legislators and Governor Hochul to keep the Performing Arts Centers of Upstate New York at the <clears throat> heart of the continuing success of Upstate's downtown, says Philip Morris. Philip used to be uh, right around here. Uh, he's now the CEO of Proctor's 
Collaborative, formed in response to the impact of COVID on the art centers, a live downtowns includes members of 13 facilities with an average age of nearly 100 years. So they're just like our own Regulin 8s, they're, they're quite old. Representatives from the Alive Downtown Coalition have been meeting uh, with New York State legislators and the governor's office to discuss their importance to a city's continuing attractiveness, urban education, opportunities, and economic viability. Upstate theaters remain understaffed and are still fighting to get back to pre-pandemic audiences. So uh, let's see here. Let's just do one clip here. It says, we are proud to represent the Chautauqua region as part of this coalition, which covers most of upstate Western New York in the Southern tier, remarked Reg Linnae's Center for the Arts Executive Director, Hillary Meyer. This uh, funding will help fund the operational costs of our organization, including support for our staff members who help drive our local economy. So good things are coming to the Reg Linnae in forms of some uh, financing from the state. So good on you guys, and we hope to continue to see you for many, many years. Next, got the next slide. This is an old friend of mine, Hector Alverio. You might say, who's Hector Alverio? Hector is the owner of the Hotspot Cafe, and I think there he is. He's right in the middle with that big grin, and he's holding a little uh, uh, word there. I've known Hector, holy mackerel. Let's see, I gotta think about this for a minute well over 25 years. Uh, he and I worked together when I was the administrator at the La Guida Center for BOCES, and Hector was part of my staff there. Well, he's moved on to bigger and better things. There he is with his wife, Michelle, on, let's see, the left side. So let me read what it says here. Hector Alvario, owner of a hot spot cafe named the Small Business Association's Minority Small Business Person of the Year. Hector, who knew? Okay, officials pictured left to right at Courtney Curatolo. She's the director of the Small Business Development Center at JCC. Of course, Michelle Alverio, uh, part of the Hotspot Cafe. There's Hector. Uh, then Danny Hickman, who's part of the business advisory of uh, the Small Business Development Corporation at JCC. And of course, our uh, county executive, PJ Wendell. On Friday, May 5th, the county executive joined representatives from the Small Business Development Center at JCC and the United States Small Business Administration Buffalo District to honor Hector Avelio, owner of the Hotspot Cafe, who is named uh, the Small Business Person of the Year. Hector was nominated by his fellow businesses and uh, director, advisor, Danny Hickman. Uh, as a minority entrepreneur, Hector opened his cafe on Valentine's Day 2020 just before the onset of COVID. Yeah, it was probably like uh, two weeks beforehand. During the shutdown, he implemented takeout service and not only survived, but thrived. He has continued to grow his business into catering ventures as well. Congratulations to Hector and his wife, Michelle, on this well-deserved recognition. If you haven't stopped down, they're right down in the middle of downtown, uh, the hot spot, and uh, it's been a variety of different businesses. I think it used to be Cooper's, and before that, I forgot the name of it, but it's right there. Uh, and Hector, I'm gonna have to stop down and get one of those sandwiches I've been seeing on Facebook, so congratulations. Okay, uh, three more quick ones here. Uh, shred it. Okay, uh, this is gonna pop up here, and I'll tell you about that in a second. And this is a fundraiser for the uh, Westfield Memorial Hospital uh, Auxiliary. And that's going to be held today as we speak. So if you're catching it right now, as soon as the show's over, grab all those uh, papers that you've been wanting to shred and get rid of. Uh, they're taking um, boxfuls of $10. They shred it for you. And unless you're a um, genius, you can never put it back together again and figure out <laughs> who you are or what it says. All right. So that's a, a fun event, and that you'll be supporting the good work of the hospital auxiliary over there in Westfield. Okay, next at one o'clock today, I believe, yep, I'll be over there, is the Beach Glass Rally. And more or less what this is, is a fun event that's uh, trying to get people together to clean up the beach over in Barcelona. Barcelona, if you go out Route 394, go right straight through the light of Westfield and go to the, go right down to the lake, and you're gonna make a right, and then go over to where the Harbor Master is, and they're all gonna meet down there. You're gonna give out bags uh, for picking up garbage, but besides that, 
they're going to have kite flying, and they're going to be doing sand castles, and they're going to have a bonfire at 5 o'clock, I believe, and they're just going to have all kinds of fun things going on. There's going to be food trucks and a whole lot more. So not only is it a fun day uh, to clean up the beach, but uh, uh, you can participate in some fun family activities. So that's going to be today from 1 to 5. And then finally, my friends at Lakeshore Center for the Arts, reminding you, coming up at the end of the month, They've been going through uh, all the plays that they uh, had submitted. Well, I guess it was close to 200 plays from around the world. Uh, the actual performances and final awarding of the best of the best will be Friday the 26th, which are going to be the comedies. Saturday the 27th are the dramas, and then the finals, um, May 28th. Okay, so you're encouraged to participate by getting a ticket and sit down and enjoy some really fine plays. I helped to do some of the voiceovers in the, uh, in the first round of competitions and we had a great time uh, dealing with plays that were written by some very talented people. So Lakeshore Center for the Arts coming up at the end of the month. All right, that's all I got for now. We're going to take a little breather and we'll be right back. Stay tuned. You've messed up your son's haircut. Mm -hmm. Do you A, try to fix it? Like it never happened. B, work with what you got. Or C, show solidarity. Thank you, babe. As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. My hair hurts. My mother used to have this thing that she bought. I don't know where she bought it from, somewhere. I can't say online because we didn't have online businesses, but she bought something she saw in the magazine and everything was fine until she got to the back of your neck and then it just caught it. And she said, sit there and be quiet. <laughs> yes, mother. Oh, gosh. Well, if you are like me, you enjoy a certain amount of, of history of where we live or where we've been. And my guest today is Michelle Henry, who uh, is an historian. You have a degree in archaeology, right? Yes. And she's been on the show before, and I just enjoy so much talking with you because many of you know I'm the town historian in Ripley, so welcome back. Thank you. Michelle, uh, you're, really, you're like, I always say this, you're like a walking book of, of, of information. I mean, it's, it's amazing what you know about our county. Well, I um, have been involved in the history of Chautauqua County since 1989. Wow. So I've been around a while. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, every day is a learning experience. So every, every request that comes your way, every inquiry, um, usually results in me learning something I didn't know. Yeah. So it's always fun. Um, you served as our uh, county historian. Historian, right? Right. I think you said that. Yes. And so what, what, would, what does a county historian do? Um, well, a county historian's role is to promote local history, assist with historic preservation endeavors, um, do research and writing on local history. Um, we are not supposed to collect artifacts. You know, we're supposed to be a conduit. So if somebody contacts us and wants to make a donation of some artifact, we try to help them find the right local historical repository. Find their home. Yeah. Right. So, um, so I think it's really important for the historians in the county to network with the historical societies. Um, you know, I think we can all benefit from um, sharing uh, information and resources together. Right. So I think that's really important. No. I think I got this right. Every town in New York State is required to have a town historian? Every municipality in municipality. New York State. I think we're the only state in the country that requires every municipality. So every city, village, um, town, county is required to appoint a historian. Right. And um, there are, you know, uh, an outline of the duties and responsibilities that were prepared by the New York State Museum and the State Historian's Office to try to help guide people. Because some people get appointed historian without really knowing what it is they're supposed to do. So... Um, so there are there are resources that can help right. somebody with that. And before the show, we uh, you and I were having a lengthy talk about some of the stuff that I've been involved with as town historian of Ripley, and I am totally fascinated. A week has not gone by probably for the last six months that I haven't had well the last three years for that matter, but mostly in the last six months it seems um, 
people are calling me for all kinds of pieces of information. And it's not like, you know, who was my great grandfather kind of stuff, but it's more like what was in that building once upon a time? Or can you tell me, um, what do you know about this accident that took place back in the 1800s? Or, you know, it's more kind of informational rather than trying to do some somebody's genealogy, you right. know? And, uh, and I've had the opportunity to give a few talks and things like that. So yeah, it's, it's, it's good stuff. But what, what's the intrigue that people have about history? Well, I really think that um, history helps give you a better sense of place. You know, I think that um, when you live in a community, it really helps you appreciate what's there now by understanding why it's there. You know, why are the streets named mm -hmm. what they're named? Why are these buildings here? Why, you know, how did the town interact with the, the train line that runs through? Because all of that, um, you know, was shaped by uh, the historical development of the county. And I think if you understand that, and a lot of people don't really stop to think about you know, um, why there are communities along the train lines or why the train lines run, you know, where they do in the county. And, um, you know, our relationship with water sources, you mm -hmm. know, all of that um, just helps us better understand why our community looks the way it does today. We seem to kind of, young people sometimes, we just kind of bumble our way through life. And then all of a sudden, for some reason, someday we all of a sudden go, well, what you're just saying is like, well, how come? You know, we don't get to that how come very early in life for some reason. But, as I, and I've, I've lived in Ripley for now well over 40 years, and I never had realized to what you had said that the streets were named for the early settlers, you know, or um, the trolley lines that connected, not Ripley so much, but Buffalo to Erie to Pittsburgh, and we just happened to be along the way. or you know, the fishing industry or, or whatever. And uh, it, it's, it's almost lost sometimes. And I think as town historians or historians, um, it's our job to kind of keep the, the story alive. You mentioned historical societies. What historical societies are in Chautauqua County? Oh gosh. I think we have it. There's at least 23. Oh, um, really? Yeah, so almost every single one of our towns or our communities has a historical society, and um, you know, for the most part, they're run by volunteers. You know, there there aren't a lot of paid staff, mm -hmm. um, and you know, some of them are only open in the summer. Some are only open on weekends, but they all were started by people um, often right around the American Bicentennial, when people suddenly, you know, really did take an interest in history, mm -hmm. um, who have collected things or been given things um, that are really valuable to their town's history. Sort of like these museums? Yeah, yes, yes. So um, I don't have one. I need one. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it does take, you know, it, it's... Um, yeah. It, it's not easy to run a historical yeah. society. Yeah, they have a real good plan um, and some funding. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I do think it's really important to you know just remind people that the, the role of a historical society is to preserve things in perpetuity. So you know if you if you um, have a building that isn't heated all winter or you don't have an inventory of what you have in your collection, mm -hmm. um, you're less likely to succeed in that endeavor because whatever we have now we want to make sure is here in a hundred years or two hundred right. years. So um, it takes money, it takes resources, it takes some knowledge. But um, you know, most of our communities at some point have undertaken that and have these wonderful collections. And I always tell people, you know, you don't have to go to the Smithsonian to find a treasure trove of historical information. It's here. You know, all of our you think across the country, all the different local historical societies that exist, and they really hold the information that's relevant to your community. So they're the ones who are trying very hard to do a job to uh, preserve your history. So the, the, the local townships may have a historical society. Chances are every one of the municipalities has a town historian, but there's a county level too, right? Right, so the, there is a county historical society and ours is one of the oldest continuously running ones in New York State. It was started in 1883. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's wonderful because it was started by the children of some of our pioneer settlers. So their really? collections, yeah. So they, in the, um, in the 1880s, they got together and they were also a, um, called a scientific society. So they wrote mm. scientific 
papers and read them at their meetings. Um, and most of those exist in the collection there. Mm -hmm. And um, they moved into the McClurg Mansion in 1952, which is located in Westfield. And uh, unfortunately, COVID didn't allow them to celebrate their 200th no. anniversary. But how many buildings in the county are over 200 years old? Yeah. It's remarkable that the building exists. It's in wonderful shape and it's, um, it's open to the public. So. And I know they've done a number of uh, renovations. Yes. And uh, John Wolf, who was part of that project for quite a long time, mm -hmm. uh, he has been on the show. They did a lot of fundraisers and they redid the staircase and they uh, redid some supports, the walls and things like that. So if it, I, I suppose, uh, is it open to the public? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so yes, there are um, guided tours mm -hmm. that you can have and um, there's continuing work going on. If you've driven by it recently, you've noticed it's been painted. The porches have been rebuilt. Um, there's a lot going on. June 10th is their gala to celebrate the work that's been done. Uh, you can get a ticket for that at the museum. They'll have wonderful food and the Civil War reenactors will be there. Right, that's in and June. Lincoln yep. um, and Mrs. Lincoln will be there. So it's a great chance to see the building, enjoy some good food. Right. And so you have places like the Yorka Museum and yes. the Fenton. In the Fenton, the Barker Museum in Fredonia, mm -hmm. Cherry Creek has a museum, mm -hmm. Town of Chautauqua has the train station at yeah. the foot of the hill. Yeah. Um, so uh, Harmony good. has a huge historical society, Harmony oh. Historical. So, so some bus die. Good day trips for yes. families to go yes. visit. Absolutely. Or just local people that have moved into the area or if you've lived there all your life and didn't realize that it was there, it's good. It's a good time. Absolutely. Um, well, thanks for that, that overview of, of, of the historians and the historical uh, assets that we have here. I, I actually come on the show and we talked a little bit about this before, but it's been some time and it was the Chautauqua County Poor Farm. Poor farm I know. And it's like, <laughs> wow, that seems like a sad topic, but it really yeah. played a major role in the lives of, of, the, of the people here at one time. Yeah, it was a huge function of the county government. And um, I, I, we have talked about it before, but it seems like it's always fascinating to people to hear about the poor farm or even just to realize that we had one. I would bet less than a percent of, of Chautauqua County people know that there were, ever was a poor farm. I know, and I was just speaking with a group of people recently and I said something kind of offhandedly about, oh, well, on the poor farm, and they're like, the what? And I thought, oh, I can't believe, you know, because um, that is another thing that's interesting. If you look back in our town, every town's records, the people um, who were, the, the roles that people played are so different. You know, we had uh, fence viewers. Yes. And, and the guys who inspected the roads and yes. the weights and measures and, and stuff. Yeah. Um, somebody who was in charge of tracking stray livestock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then every town had a poor master. And so I think that, um, you know, that was a function of the towns from the time they were formed. And it was, you know, of course, across New York State, every town had somebody who was in charge of determining who was not able to support themselves in their town. And um, the, they, the way they dealt with them before there was a poor farm was to hold a public auction. And, and people were actually auctioned off, which sounds quite the insensitive. Were yes. Auctioned? So if you were declared indigent, by your town, um, there would be an auction and people would bid on what they thought it would take to provide you or your family, you and your family, with food, clothing and shelter for a year. And the low bidder was basically awarded those indigent people. All right, let's, like, I, I've never heard this before. Yeah, All right, so let's just say Mr. Whatever X is auctioned. That sounds like a terrible term. Doesn't it? It sounds like uh, indentured servitude. Yeah. And basically it was. So, so, the, so whoever was the low bidder was basically awarded those people. The town had to keep track of who, bidded, how, who bid how much and um, which indigent you know, was awarded to so them. So that person that's took been them auctioned home, would come to your house. Took them home yeah. and you were obligated to provide them with food, clothing, and shelter for the year. And they basically you know, had to work on your farm. Um, and you can imagine in some circumstances, those people were not treated very well. Mm -hmm. So um, across New York State, there were accounts of people who were not given shoes in the winter, who were forced to sleep in the barn, who were not fed adequately. You know, so, and it was also um, an accounting, you know, um, 
difficulty because the local poor master had to keep track of who bid how much. Then they had to um, basically create a tax to cover that. So then the local people had to be taxed. And then all of that needed to be because at that time the town supervisors can, made up our, our county board of supervisors. Right. So then that all had to be taken to the county and be audited. Um, you know, so there was there was just a lot of accounting, um, a lot of paperwork. I know this is a hard question, and, and I only <laughs> ask it because it popped into my mind. Are we talking a lot of people here? Um, in some towns, no. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, as different immigrant group, groups came in, you mm -hmm. know, there were times when there would be a spike in um, poor. Right. Um, and you know, there are. If you read the really early newspapers of the county, sometimes you'll see. Um, and an argument between two towns about whether this person was actually a town resident of their town or the other town. Oh my gosh! Um, <laughs> That's true. That those lines were kind of fuzzy, weren't they? Well, and um, you know, you were supposed to have been a, a resident for a year of that town to be considered that town's indigent. Mm -hmm. um, there are accusations from one town to another that oh, you move that family into our town in the dead of night to avoid having to put Ooh. them on your tax rolls as indigent. So. Across New York State in 1829, um, some laws were passed that counties of a certain size had to build a poor farm. And you know, some people think, oh gosh, that just sounds dreadful. But the poor farm was actually considered to be an improvement over the earlier system. And it was um, supposed to provide systematic care. So anybody in the county who was declared indigent by their town would be sent to the poor farm, which was a county operation, and they would be provided with um, you know, care, and um, they also would work on the farm to whatever degree they were able to, and um, and so in 1830, the county, because of its size, was required to find a place, a suitable farm for a poor farm. So it's quite early in our history. I guess so. And so um, there was a group of men who formed a committee and they found a farm in DeWittville of 90 acres and they purchased it with county money and they built a building and the first poor were admitted there in December of 1831. So um, it was, you know, a really, it was a vital function of county government. It was the only real social welfare program that existed. So you, you didn't have any other place to get assistance if you needed it okay. um, prior to that. And so people were sent there, often temporarily, for whatever their situation was that they needed aid. So it wasn't considered a life sentence. Um, and they would do work on the farm. Um, women, you know, cooked, cleaned, sewed. Um, they had, there were children there, so they had people um, who, if they were capable of giving instruction, they taught the children, some of the oh, residents. So they didn't go to the local schools, they went school They had right their there. own little schoolhouse right there. Um, and they actually were a very um, well-run farm. And it grew to the point where it was over 435 acres in Whoa. size. They had their own bakery, they had livestock. Um, they provided the food for the jail, hmm. which I think was really interesting. So not only did they feed the inmates at the poor farm, but they also were able to provide food for the- So um, they were self-sustaining. They were very self-sustaining. Um, it, it, the, <laughs> You know, I just, I, I'm just surprised by the, um, the number of people, you know, when people come to my, when the people used to come to my office as county historian and we've searched for some family members and I'll say like, well, let's look in the indexes to the poor farm. And they're like, oh gosh, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't know. And I think, well, if, if your ancestor was there and they hadn't been provided with care, you might not exist. You know, so it was it was important um, for the county to be able to help people who needed it. Um, the very first year that they were there, of course, there were I think there were three deaths the first year, and so they established a cemetery, and that cemetery was used for over a hundred years or about a hundred years. I think 1928 was the last time we find anyone listed as being buried there. And, um, and that's still county property, and the county maintains it. Are there headstones? There are, um, so for the first 30 years, they, we don't know what they use. They might have used wooden crosses. 
Um, but then in that, in that time period, the cemetery grew to capacity. Mm. And so they doubled its size. And in 1864, they erected an obelisk in the middle of the cemetery that says this is dedicated to the first 600 inmates Whoa. buried here. So we know by 1864, there were 600 people or so buried in the cemetery. They called them inmates? They called them inmates. Um, there were um, people, if you were found to be vagrant or, mm -hmm. or peddling, sometimes you would be sent there. So you could be sentenced to serve time at the poor farm. So it wasn't so much as a jail sentence, it was like a lesser maybe? Right, it was a way to get vagrants off mm -hmm. of street corners. Hmm. And um, you know, there were no, uh, you weren't confined. So often those people just disappeared in the dead of night, mm -hmm. you know, and, and sometimes they came back. You know, they were found back in their town. Um, so then after, in 1864, we, we started to find a list of um, cemetery gravestones that were just numbered. So it was an obel, it was just a, a rectangular slab of granite with a number. Mm. And so in 1864, we found maybe about 150 names with the date of death, mm -hmm. the cause of death and the stone number. Okay. Um, and then we find another list starting in about 1878 we don't have a complete list. Mm -hmm. So it's it, it, different um, superintendents of the poor were better at record keeping than others. Mm -hmm. So for some superintendents, we have really detailed records of daily activities, who was admitted, who was discharged, who died, who had a child, um, and others very, very light record keepers. So there's gaps in our information. Um, if somebody went there and had a child and that child was not wanted, um, you know, if you think about it from a county taxpayer's perspective, the county was trying to provide care at the most reasonable cost. And so the best interest of the child at the time was to just find it a good placement. And so it'll say sometimes in the records, um, you know, Betsy Smith had a baby boy uh, yesterday. He was given to a good family. Mm -hmm. And that's it. We don't know, you know, we don't know who the, so um, by today's standards, there's, you know, a lack of information or a lack of documentation, but they were trying to do what was in the best interest. Right, that, as um, humane as they could, it sounds like, too. Right, right. All right, let's take a little breather, okay? Folks, you're watching Chautauqua Sunrise, I'm Doc Hamels, and I neglected to remind you that this is a live talk show, and if you want to give us a call at 716 seven by three five two two five please do and you can give michelle a question or two uh if you have a comment something you want to share or if you have a historical piece of information that we should know about let us know also throughout the week if you want to send in an, uh, an announcement or whatever give, give us a little email at chautauqua sunrise at gmail.com okay so back to you so i'm i'm intrigued by about this Farm. So what did they raise? What did they do there? Like livestock and stuff? Oh, sure. They had cattle. Um, they had sheep. They had pigs. Um, they also grew, you know, tons of potatoes and turnips and cabbage and other vegetables. Uh, they made um, bread. Um, it looked like a little city. It was. It was uh, a, a big complex. And it continued to grow um, in 1869. They expanded their building and they built a, a brick building that at the time was considered to be the most beautiful government building in Chautauqua County. So I think that's a testament too to the fact that um, the county did you know, care about how the poor was treated mm -hmm. and they, they wanted to have it be a place that they could be proud of. Well, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but during that period of time, I would say from early 1800s, let's say 1820s, to about 18s in the 70s or something, it was booming. The, the whole western New York area was just booming. Uh, lots of lots of construction, lots of people moving into the area. I noticed that uh, in my records, especially right around, um, let me think about this for a minute, 1893 I think it was, it just seemed like there was a lot of stuff happening. Lots of families having kids and schools were being built. So that that whole kind of 100 years in there, it was a, a major, major growth area for Chautauqua County. Is that pretty much right? Right, sure, yes. And, um, you know, it, 
We're kind of unique in New York State in the fact that um, the New York and Erie Railroad opened in 1851 there, oh, there you go. from New York Harbor to Dunkirk. Mm -hmm. So it was the longest trunk line in the world. It was an engineering marvel. Um, and what it did is it allowed New York City to put newly arriving immigrants on that train and send them to Dunkirk. Uh, so okay. in 1851, we suddenly started seeing a daily train of immigrants arrive in Dunkirk. And often they were people who had you know, just gotten to New York City three days earlier. Whoa. And you know, a lot of those folks were taken advantage of by ship lines yeah. and by ship captains. And so they often needed assistance, even if it was just temporary. Mm -hmm. And so New York State law required us required everybody, every county, to transport new, newly arriving immigrants to the poor farm mm. and provide them with assistance. So we had to transport them from Dunkirk to DeWittville and then keep a separate ledger of all the immigrants that were aided because the way the county poor farm functioned was to tax each town based on the number of indigents that it sent there. Mm -hmm. And these people weren't town residents, so they couldn't tax the towns. So suddenly the county had this huge influx of people needing care and there was no way to tax anyone to collect money for mm -hmm. it. So, um, so that just continued in 1851. It continued to increase through the 1860s as more and more immigrants were arriving. And um, because Dunkirk was the terminus of the line, we were getting the, the brunt of that. And luckily, because we hoped to get reimbursed by the commissioners of emigration in New York City, we kept very detailed ledgers of who it. was coming in. Uh -huh. So we knew that the ship they came on, the members of their party, their ages, where they came from. Oh, wow. it's, it's wonderful. So, um, so we, we kept this very detailed ledger hoping that we'd get reimbursed, which um, we actually had to threaten to sue to get it because we just weren't, weren't getting the money back. And, um, and now that's been indexed by um, two women who were very um, incredible genealogists in the county. So we have this great um, published index of all the immigrants who received aid at the poor farm. And there's over 60,000 people. What? 60,000? Oh my Yeah, from God. 1851 to about, um, I think, 1867. So in that time period, you know, and so a lot of folks who um, you know live in other parts of the country are interested in tracking their immigrant ancestors. And how would you know, like if you lived in Wisconsin or California or wherever, how would you know how your ancestors got to where they were going? And this ledger can provide them with some clues about how they got into this country and how they made their way. Because a lot of folks were coming um, to Dunkirk to get to the Great Lakes to go farther west. You know, that's interesting that you note that because some of the work I've been doing for some people, as I'm reading through reports and, and notations, that a lot of them did go out North Dakota to Illinois, out to New Mexico, California, and things like that. But they, they started in Ripley, but before they got to Ripley, they came maybe they through Dunkirk have. or wherever. Right. And I know, for instance, in Ripley, there was a, a large influx of Irish. Obviously, Clymer has a large influx of Dutch and so forth. So why was that? How did that all work as far as why do certain countries in certain mm. spots? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? I think, um, you know, I think you have to wonder if you were choosing to leave Germany mm -hmm. and to come to the United States, where would you decide to go when you got here? You know, like you, where you, I knew you, somebody, I guess. Exactly, right? exactly. So, so often we find people, um, we're coming specifically to a certain part of the county or part of the country based on people from their community who came before them. There you go. And so sometimes it was church members, mm -hmm. you know, or just community members or just extended family. And so um, recently uh, a, a, a German settlement in the town of Mina has come to light to me and I'm intrigued Ooh, by it because okay. I didn't really realize there were that many. I never heard that. Right. So um, there was a huge influx of Germans um, who were like really Prussian mm -hmm. in the 1840s, okay. leaving Prussia. And, um, and a lot of them came to Western New York to Niagara County, Orleans County, and some of them came to Mina. Hmm. So, um, I, you know, it's just one of those things I just recently okay. kind of decided I need to find out more about. Okay, let's hold that thought, we have a phone call. Okay. Ready? Good morning, caller. 
Good morning, Jack. Hey, Good Linda. morning, Michelle. Michelle, I always love seeing you on the show uh, because you, you, you discuss so well my favorite topic, the history of Chautauqua County. Oh, thanks. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm so enthused about it. There's so much here. And you said there's 23 different historical groups in Chautauqua County? Yes. Oh, that's that's really that's really wonderful. I plan on uh, I hope to join our local historical group because there's so much here. Um, I have a, a question for you. Um, I heard that you were talking about the railroad. That the if you take the railroad line that's uh, right here at Mayville, behind the watermark, and, and near the old train depot, if you if you would take that it would go right to Cory. Is that true? Yes, one of those lines did. Uh huh. Went from yeah. Portland up over the hill to Cory. Uh huh. It's it's really quite fascinating. Yes. And I also heard that when the um, uh, people uh, came here from Sweden, uh, that they had wanted to go another place, was it Ohio or something, and they came here by mistake on the boat, uh, on Lake. It, Lake Erie, and um, that uh, they decided to go to Jamestown because it most closely resembled Sweden. Is that true? Yeah, I think I've heard that too. And I, I think that, um, you know, we had really good cheap farmland, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, and, I, and I think that a lot of um, folks from Germany and, and Sweden and other places um, came because it just wasn't possible to own land mm. in their home wow. countries. And they could come here and buy, um, you know, substantial amounts of land for a really good price and be able to make a, a decent living. So I think that's what really motivated a lot of people to come here. Well, the geography here is beautiful. And Jamestown geography is just gorgeous. Well, a lot, a lot of it had to do with the, the, the timber uh, business, too. And yeah. uh, in Europe back in those days, they had exhausted a lot of the, the resources and right. uh, so coming here, it was like, wow, you know, look at the oaks and the maples and things. Yeah, and speaking of timber, I heard that Arkwright was a rainforest many years ago. Is that true? A rainforest? Well, maybe prehistorically. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. you know, we yeah. had ocean, you know, this part of the mm -hmm. um, world had, a, you know, the ice cover and then um, an ocean, um, which is why we find so many neat di different types of rocks and right. stones along the, the Right, yeah, right. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I suppose. Could, yeah, have been. could be. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Doc, I wanted to say thank you very much to your terrific volunteers, to Randy Bird and uh, Justin Bird and Jeff Zook for the wonderful job they did to help us with our presentation, for the Helen Keller uh, Little Known Facts sponsored by the Lions Club. Cool. They were terrific, and thank you very much all right well kudos to the to the team here okay yes, and, and, <laughs> and thank you to you with the rotary the volunteer groups and i have to say that our presentation on may 8th uh was a success we were filled to capacity awesome well yeah. you know there's the power of the media you know we, uh -huh. we try to get out there and help you guys in any way we can and that's oh, what we do thank you okay well they did a terrific job and randy did the most darling cartoon about the Lions Club and yeah. his glasses. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, we, we had it here. We he played it the other day. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. And uh, I wish everybody a great weekend and happy Mother's happy Day. Happy Mother's everybody. Day to you, too, as well. Thanks. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Linda. Great questions, huh? I should mention there is a countywide museum brochure mm -hmm. that we developed during the county's bicentennial. And right. we've updated it and reprinted it since then. So it's a list of all the historical societies um, who chose to participate with a map. Mm -hmm. And you can get that at um, the, the visitor center, um, at the courthouse, at a lot of our local museums have the brochure to give out at the County Historical Society in Westfield. So it'll give you a really good idea of all the different historical societies and groups that are out there. Right. So. Okay, so back to the poor farm. So it would seem we sort of have a similar process today where people come into our country and they're processed, but they don't go to a poor farm, but we're hooking them up with some support services or, you know what I mean? There's, a, there's a, still kind of a thin formula to some of that. 
or where they're being, well, look at now. I mean, they're coming across the borders, and the governor there says, well, you can't stay here. They're shipping them somewhere else. So, I mean, that's sort of what they did in those days, it sounds like. Right, right. Um, yeah, we, um, you know, we had so many immigrants coming to Dunkirk, and you know, I guess the, I guess you could say, unfortunately, the poor farm wasn't located there. It was right. located in DeWittville. So then we had the added um, cost of transporting them there. But, you know, a lot of folks, they just needed to um, get here and establish themselves and, and uh, enabling them to stay at the poor farm. Um, sometimes, you know, they could take local jobs for hire. They could earn a little money, um, wait for a particular ship to come into Dunkirk Harbor to take them farther west. So many of them, um, some stayed. You know, they, they arrived here and they liked it well enough mm -hmm. that they stayed. So it was, uh, it was temporary assistance that was desperately needed and it provided them the ability to establish themselves here. You know, and I, th I think I think I'm right on this. If you look at it from the 30,000 foot mark, looking down on history, I think our country was encouraging immigration. We were encouraging people to expand our western front, to cultivate it, to form cities, to s create industry. Um, you know, th th there was nobody here. And in order to have a, a, a strong country, we, we needed uh, workers, we needed the, the guys that were in the trades and the ladies in the trades and and farmers and things like that to feed the people here. So I think this was, am I right? It was a cohesive push that had lots of levels to it to create a great country. I mean, when you talk about the 1840s, we're not talking a very old country. We're like 50 some right. years old. Right. Well, even it's interesting um, w when the War of 1812 started, um, you know, the Holland Land Company was still trying to get people to come west. And we were the western frontier. We were, we very much And, were. Um, you know, the, the fear of England invading from Canada mm -hmm. was real. Yeah. And so having people here was one way to buffer against an easy invasion. You know, so the more people that were out here in the western lands, mm -hmm. the less likely it would be that England would choose to come over and invade. And so there's always been, you know, a strategy to to wanting people to move west and to to establish themselves, um, you know, just like when we were debating with France over mm -hmm. Louisiana mm -hmm. and, and with Spain um, for right. the southwest. So having a population there helped ensure that it would retain in our control. Right. And they would have their local militias and things like that. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. It, it's so intricate, and people, they, they look at the, the Reader's Digest version of history. I, I don't mean to pick on Reader's Digest, but you know what I mean. It's just this glossed over, or even a, a, media, a YouTube version of it, or whatever. It, but there's so many layers to this, and uh, this is just one little piece of that history. But it was right here in Chautauqua County. Right, right. And I think our history relates in so many ways to a larger national theme. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important for people to understand, too, that you know what happened here didn't happen in a vacuum. Right. It was all part of a much bigger picture. All right, for those that are watching, because we got about two minutes left, so if somebody were to say, sure, there's, there, there was a poor farm, where is it and can they go to it? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the county sold it when they built the nursing home in Dunkirk. Mm -hmm. um, the property was sold. The buildings were all um, left in disrepair and had to be demolished. So all of these incredibly beautiful buildings and barns, the mm. barns were just phenomenal, are all gone. Um, it's privately owned now. So the only part of it that the county still retains is the cemetery. cemetery. And it's landlocked by private property. Oh, that's... So um, I, I've always, and I, you know, I've been going out there um, for 23 years. Um, I've always been able, to, you know, I just call the lo local owners of the land, ask them if it's okay if I mm, come. Sure. And they've been wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I think that they're very gracious in letting people cross their land. I wouldn't want anyone to abuse that. You know, right. I, I would always want people to just make sure that it's okay. Um, and now that the county is, is maintaining the cemetery, uh, there's a, a boulder at the end of it with a bronze plaque so that you know you know, you've, you're walking into a cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important for us to maintain that because of the number of people who sure. are buried there. Respect to them. Yeah. Well, Michelle, as always, fascinating.
uh, I thank you for coming on the show and um, it's you always bring a lot of light to our history here so thank you oh, well happy to well we'll have to do this again sure. folks you've been listening to Stock Sunrise I'm Doc Hamels my guest today is Michelle Henry historian extraordinaire mm-hmm. I'll call you <laughs> Um, thanks for joining us and uh, happy Mother's Day. Enjoy your families and get together and appreciate what moms do. And remember, there's all forms of moms out there. Have a great weekend. We'll do this all again next Saturday right here on Access Chautauqua 1301 on Spectrum. Um, have a good weekend. Bye now. <laughs>